Hi, I'm Mike and welcome to Aircrew Interview. John Hutchinson was a BA Concorde captain from 1977 to 1992. In this interview, he talks about his whole Concorde career and also gives a nice tour of the cockpit based at Duxford. He also chats about the 707, 747, the Shackletons with uh, the RAF and also the Harvard in Canada. We've also got a new newsletter which you can go and sign up for for exclusive info and any other deals we have at aircrewinterview.tv. Please enjoy and thanks for watching. So John, when did you become interested in aviation? I think like, I was interested in aviation from the age of about seven or eight. I have no idea why. I was born in India. We lived in India until 1947, 1948. I'd never saw an aeroplane all the time I was in India. I didn't, I'd never actually seen a live aeroplane. Wow. And yet somehow or other, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. It was sort of programmed into me. And I know that because I collected all these books, the Boys Wonder Book of the Royal Air Force and um, I aircraft identification books and all that sort of thing, which I could get my hands on in India. And we got back to England and my mother bought me a joyride in a Tiger Moth out of Bembridge Airport, Isle of Wight. And all that did was confirm to me what I already knew I wanted to fly aeroplanes and I joined the Royal Air Force on my 18th birthday and uh, the rest as they say is history. <laughs> I had never flown an aeroplane in my life, I'd simply had this one joy ride in a Tiger Moth. I didn't drive a car um, and I'm confronted with this chunky aeroplane in Harvard, it's a big piece of yeah. heavy metal and I had a flying instructor whose name was John Ayres who's a miserable sir and so <laughs> and I, I, was, I was a very very apprehensive very underconfident young 18 and a half year old and come the first flying test which was the 15 hour preliminary clear hood they called it I failed it abysmally really? I absolutely failed it and I was on the point of being scrubbed from the course and I was reallocated a new instructor and he managed slowly to build up my confidence and get me going and he got me solo and then suddenly at about I don't know 25 30 hours of flying on the Harvard suddenly it all clicked into place and from that moment on, I've never, ever had a problem in a flying course, really? any flying course I've ever done since. But having gone through this sort of um, ordeal by far of those first sort of 20 flying hours on the Harvard, yeah. where I really didn't know whether I was coming or going, suddenly everything clicked into place. And, um, you know, I owe, I owe the Harvard a huge debt of gratitude actually because it was an airplane that had vices it would tip up onto its nose very easily it would ground loop very easily it would flick stall if you pulled too tightly in a turn it had all sorts of little vices and things that could catch you out and what it taught you above all else was respect for the air and respect for airplanes and that is something that was programmed into me forevermore by the Harvard and then I went up to Kinloss and by now I suppose we're talking about September 1957 for the operational conversion onto the Shackleton yeah. and that was a tough course it went on quite a long time and you were learning all the sort of um, procedures and drills and things for submarine hunting basically yeah. Is that what the Shackleton was designed for? Yep, it was a maritime patrol aircraft, an anti-submarine aircraft. And that was, the whole training was to do with um, tracking submarines and keeping an eye on, on Russian warships as well. Yeah. <coughs> and it was a, a tremendous course. And what I'm really proud of now, and as I look back on it, 
is that the version of the Shackleton I went on to was the Mark I Shackleton. So it was a tail dragger, none of this poncy nose wheel stuff. This, was a, this was a proper aeroplane, serious aeroplane. And basically, you know, a direct descendant of the Lancaster. Yeah. Absolutely direct descendant of the Lancaster. Powered with four Rolls-Royce Griffin engines, contra-rotating propellers. Um, it was a fabulous piece of kit and yeah. it served the Air Force very, very well over a very long period of time. It did go on a long time, didn't it? It went on a very long time. I don't want short haul flying. Yeah. I want long haul flying. I want the big jets. So I opted for BOAC and I did my induction course with them and was posted onto the 707, Boeing 707 which was a great aeroplane and it's unbelievable looking back on it now you know we're so used to GPS inertial navigation and all that stuff yeah the Boeing 707 required a flight navigator and one of the first things I had to do was to get a flight navigator's license oh really yep I okay. used to hold a flight navigator's license and this was a very intense course probably one of the most intense courses I've ever done. It not only involved the ground school element, learning, you know, how to do air plots and all the chart work, um, and how to use a sextant. It also involved um, training flights uh, down to Bermuda, which is a great place to, to use as a as a nav route because if you miss Bermuda you're already stuffed <laughs> <coughs> you know there's nothing else within 800 miles in any given direction so it concentrated the mind enormously and by the by one of the instructors um, that I used to fly with regularly was a gentleman called Norman Tebbit who subsequently of course became Lord Tebbit as we all know and very, very nice chap he was, and, and a very excellent instructor as well, I have to say. Anyway, so there was the 707, and in 19, January 1971, I was posted on to a splendid aeroplane, the Boeing 747. Uh, yeah. And to my great joy and delight, I didn't have to navigate any longer because it had inertial navigation, which did it all for you. Well, hey. <laughs> And I then spent several years on the 747, which to this day I regard as one of the great civil airliners that was ever made. It was a lovely aeroplane to fly. In spite of its sort of bulk and size, it handled beautifully. It really did. It was a, it was a, a gentleman's aerial carriage. It was a lovely, forgiving, gentle sort of aeroplane to I fly. I always imagined it a bit sluggish. No, 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 it wasn't sluggish, it was quite responsive really. And I had a great credit to Boeing, it was a lovely aeroplane. And I had a very happy time on that. And then in 1976 I got the chance to get my command and I was offered the 707 or the VC-10. Well, I'd never flown the VC-10, I had flown the 707. And I thought, well, let's have a go at the VC-10 and see what that's like. So off I went to the VC-10. And I suppose actually the VC-10 course, this command course must have been late 1975. Because I got my command on the VC-10 in January 1976. Yes, yeah, so the course must have been in the tail end of 1975. And that was done up at Prestwick. Mm -hmm. And having got my command on the VC-10, to my total astonishment, about a year later, I put in a speculative bid for Concorde, never thinking for one second that I'd get onto it, because I was far too junior. I'd only been a captain for about a year at this point. Yeah. And I put in this bid, and to my astonishment and amazement, I learnt that I was on the next Concord course starting in May 1977. Wow. 
Wow, it was wow. So to my astonishment, as I said earlier, I suddenly found myself posted onto the Concorde fleet in the summer of 1977. And I then embarked on this very, very intense course. I tell you what, um, anybody who went onto that aeroplane to get through that course, you really had to be absolutely convinced that this is what you wanted to do above all else. The course was six months long. Six months? Yeah. I mean, that compared, and bear in mind, these are all very experienced pilots. These are not sort of raw, new, novice pilots going onto the airplane. Yeah. These are extremely experienced pilots. And British Airways was absolutely determined that they were going to avoid ever having an accident with one if they possibly could. Yeah. Because they knew that if there ever was a crash with one, it could spell the end of the whole project. Yeah. Because it's, it was such a political aeroplane. Three months of that six month course was ground school. And every week you would have ground exams, progress checks, and you had to get 90% or, or better for every one of those exams all the way through. So, and, and, and once you got, if you got behind in that course, you were doomed. You'd never yeah. catch up. There was a huge amount of learning to be done. And that was also combined with about 80, 85 hours of simulator time as well. So it was a really, really tough three months of ground school and simulator flying. At the end of that three months, you then went down, in my case, in those days, to Royal Air Force Bryce Norton, and we did circuits and bumps at Bryce Norton. And that was tremendous fun. That was my first takeoff in the aeroplane, was on, on one of these circuit and bump routines yeah. out of Bryce. Very light aeroplane. We always did the takeoffs with the reheats on regardless. There was a procedure for takeoffs without reheats, but it was it involved a whole sort of different set of calculations. And in the end, it was deemed that it was far safer just to have one standard procedure and that we'd always use reheats regardless. Yeah. So there you were, a very light aeroplane, doing these reheated takeoffs. It was like a jet fighter, really was. Yeah. So, you know, having not got onto my jet fighter earlier on in my Royal Air Force career, I now realized I, I was in something pretty much similar to, to what I'd always aspired to. <laughs> a very, very powerful, very responsive, very beautiful thoroughbred of an aeroplane. That's the only way I can describe Concorde. So we did this session of circuits and bumps at Bryce. And then, having done that, you then spent three months flying down the route with a, another training captain. They, what they did was, before Concorde ever entered service, there was a nucleus group of captains and co-pilots that were trained by British Aerospace at Filton and also trained by people like Trubshaw. They did their training with those test pilots and they were the nucleus group that then subsequently trained all the new courses that were coming onto Concorde. And I was on the third Concorde course, by the way. Wow. So it was very, very early on. Yeah. And um, I suppose it was December 1977, I was, I had the Concorde stamped up in my pilot's license and I was free to go. And the flights in those days, they were restricted in where they went. There was a flight, I think three times a week to Bahrain. And, um, and a f I can't, you know, I can't remember that. Maybe it was a daily flight to Bahrain. It was three times a week to Washington, for sure. Yeah. It might've been a daily to Bahrain. Um, so basically my, flying on Concorde for the first 18 months or so was either to Bahrain or to Washington. 
And then, of course, what happened was, I mean, New York was where we needed to get to to make the airplane viable. Yeah. The airplane entered service on the 21st of January 1976. That was the first commercial flight of Concorde to Bahrain. And it was synchronized with a departure from Paris mm -hmm. with an Air France flight going to Rio de Janeiro. In that first six months, British Airways were only flying to Bahrain and they were lobbying hard to get clearance into the United States. Yeah. And the airfield that gave us our big breakthrough was Washington's Dulles International Airport. And in the summer of 1976, we got our clearance to go into Washington's Dulles Airport on a trial basis. Mm -hmm. What they actually found was very, very, sh almost immediately, was that far from getting complaints, they're getting everybody from the local area coming up to the airport to watch the Concorde landing or, or watching it taking off. Yeah, well. And no complaints at all, when's it next coming sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and by the time I would got onto the airplane, we'd got those two routes, Bahrain and Washington. So that's where I went to for my first um, first few months of Concorde flying. And then in November, I think it was November 1978, Concorde got clearance to go into New York. And that became the bread and butter of the whole operation. Yeah. That was the big one. And we ended up with two flights a day to New York. That's a lot. The Speedbird 1 that left at 10.30 in the morning and the Speedbird 3 that left at 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. And um, th that was just fantastic. Um, on top of that, we had flights to Barbados, which was a wonderful route for the Concorde. And occasionally we'd have flights to Toronto so that was the sort of um, scheduled side of the Concorde operations. Um, what happened eventually in the, uh, around about 83, I think, 83, 84, one of the Concorde pilots said, we're not utilizing these airplanes as much as we should. We ought to do charter flights. British Airways didn't want to do charter flights. They didn't think that was dignified. Uh, absolute rubbish <laughs> and and he organized with his pub to have a one-off Concorde charter which was immensely successful yeah. and um, that then developed and in fact I ran for a short while at company uh, with a couple of other Concorde flight crew um, a charter operation we did charter flights to Newcastle, Cardiff, um, Marrakesh, Bordeaux all over the place um, and then eventually a company called Goodwood Travel in Canterbury um, developed a really terrific program of Concorde charter flights. And one of the great things about those charter flights, they, were, they should never, there were people who used to snare about, you know, oh, Concorde, that's all it's good for, charter flights. What those charter flights were doing were giving us, the taxpayer, the great British public, who owned those aeroplanes in effect, yeah. actually, um, it gave them the opportunity that they might otherwise never have got yeah. of, of a flight on, a con on an aeroplane that A, they loved and B, they, that they as taxpayers had invested in considerably. Yeah. So they, they, I was a great fan of these charter flights and, and they were great fun to fly, by the way. Um, so where do we go from here? I mean, I, I just had the most wonderful time on Concord and I stayed on that airplane for 15 years until I retired. And one of the great privileges it gave me was the opportunity to work with the BBC and do a lot of air shows with them. And we used to carry BBC crews up with us. And I was involved in that very famous picture um, of the Concorde and the Red Arrows flying over the QE2 
which was one of those sort of iconic pictures. The photograph was taken by a wonderful aviation photographer called Arthur Gibson, whom I knew very well and a great friend of mine. Um, and that sort of flying was fantastic. It really was. It had an appalling visual, which subsequently, many years later, um, probably around the early 80s, uh, was redesigned and, and reconfigured as a computer-generated visual system. Mm -hmm. But the original visual system was a great big sort of topographic map on a wall, a massive great thing over this map. Um, and it wasn't at all realistic, that visual. It was, it was actually quite disorienting. Really? I, I used to stick to the instruments yeah. and, and try and ignore the visual. I didn't want to s see the pictures the visual was giving <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. Um, in terms of the handling characteristics of that simulator and how faithful it was to the aeroplane, it was very good. Yeah, very accurate indeed. So could you talk us through your first um, reheat takeoff? What, what was it like? The first reheat takeoff was during training at Bryce Norton, very light aircraft. Um, all I could say about it is my stomach was left behind at the beginning of the runway. You know, <laughs> very light aircraft, full power, reheats on, and the airplane would go off like the proverbial off a hot shovel. <laughs> and 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 you you knew that that airplane wanted to get into the air into its natural environment just as quickly as it possibly yeah. could. It was very 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 dynamic. I can so it had a very special design. The wings that tipped down at the end. Why is this? The wings, that wing design is just fantastic. And the, and what you have to remember is it was all designed by models in wind tunnels. No computers. No computers doing it at all. They'd, they'd try a shape out, check it all out in the wind tunnel. No, we need to modify this, we need to modify that, have a bit of a twist here, a bit of a curve there. And endless, endless wind tunnel testing finally produced that wonderful ogival delta wing that you see there. And the fascinating thing about that wing is that at slow speed it produced lift in an entirely different way from a normal conventional yeah. wing. A Concorde wing, if, you, if you're on an infinite length of runway, you could go infinitely fast and you would not get airborne. It would just ground grip. Really? It was not until you rotated the airplane and presented the wing at an angle of attack to the airflow that it produced lift. And it did that by virtue of creating a massive vortex over the top surface of both wings. Yeah, yeah. And it was that low pressure within that vortex that gave you your lift. And then as you accelerated above about 250, 260 knots, gradually then the wing would behave like a normal wing and produce lift in the normal way. Yeah. But at slow speed, it relied entirely on this vortex generated lift. And it meant that the airplane didn't actually stall. Yeah. You could increase the angle of attack and the vortex would just get stronger and stronger and eventually what would happen is the center of lift would move ahead of the center of gravity yeah. and the airplane would sort of pitch up and you'd fall out of the sky. Yeah. So what was it like to fly? Was it easy to handle? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Mike. The answer to that is it was incredibly easy to fly. Incredibly easy to fly. It was extraordinarily responsive. You could fly it with your thumb and your forefinger. If you trimmed it all up, it, you could you'd just take your hands off and it would just sort of sit there. It was absolutely outstanding in terms of, of handling qualities. <coughs> and of course, it had these wonderful, very, very responsive Olympus engines with their reheats. Mm -hmm. And it, it had a, a huge reserves of power. So it was a very powerful, very responsive thoroughbred. Mm -hmm. Having said that, 
it was a demanding aeroplane to operate, if that makes sense, that distinction. In pure handling terms, very, very easy. In terms of managing the aeroplane, flying from A to B, it was definitely demanding. And to give you an example of that, for instance, you know, there were various emergencies that could happen when you were flying along at Mach 2 that would compel you to go subsonic. An engine failure is one obvious one. Yeah. Now, if that happened, you were going to be going down regardless, whether you liked it or not. And air traffic control, communications in mid-Atlantic was all done with HF, high frequency radio. And you didn't get instantaneous responses from your air traffic controllers. You had to establish communications with them. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the, 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 it, was, it was a very laborious business getting a clearance. Yeah. But the reality was that you were going to be coming down anyway into the subsonic track structures. Yeah. So you had a map showing you with where every time you flew across the Atlantic, you had a map with the subsonic tracks for that day yeah. on that map. And you'd plan your descent so that you came down between those tracks and not into them. Yeah while you're negotiating this clearance and the flight engineers transferring fuel forward to keep the center of gravity in the right place there's somebody trying to negotiate air traffic clearances the other guys trying to fly the airplane and keep it under control and and you were absolutely flat out and then you could be in a situation where you were now subsonic and you're in the middle of the atlantic and because you lost about 30% of your range by virtue of going subsonic, you could be in a situation where you could neither get onto New York or back to Heathrow. Mm. So you were, it was very much a PNR, point of no return aeroplane. Yeah. And you were looking at airfields like Shannon, Santa Maria and the Azores, Bangor, Maine, uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, Sydney, uh, Gander, Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And you were looking at all these places and you're saying, well, you know, if, if something happens now, I can make Gander. If something happens now, I can make Bangor, Maine. And eventually you get to a point where if something happens now, I can get to New York. Yeah. So you, were, you had all these sort of tactical problems going on. So that's what I mean when I say that it was a demanding aeroplane to operate. And it was an aeroplane that did not tolerate incompetence. Yes. It stood no nonsense. You had to manage it properly, properly, or it would start managing you. So you were busy basically from takeoff to landing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were absolutely. So was there a lot of pre-flight checks? Huge amount. Yeah. Uh, as far as external checks were concerned, of course, I had the great privilege of a flight engineer, so I didn't. I could sit in the nice warm flight deck drinking a cup of tea, oh, nice. while the poor old flight engineer was going out in the middle of the winter in New York in a snowstorm and <laughs> doing his pre-flight, oh, his external check. Yes, he used to love that. <laughs> I loved it, sitting in the flight deck, <clears throat> nice and warm. The most memorable problem I ever had with a Concorde, and I had remarkably few in the 15 years I was on it. We were coming back from Washington and I don't know, an hour and a half from London, something like that. And I'm about to eat a very nice piece of steak. And suddenly the airplane goes, bum, 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 bum. I mean, really violent stuff. Yeah. I was being thrown around like a sort of rat in a terrier's mouth. <laughs> and I thought, goodness gracious me, turbulence? This is turbulence like I've never known. I mean, you didn't basically get turbulence at the sort of heights we were flying yeah. at. And then I realized, of course, it wasn't turbulence at all. It was actually an engine surge. Okay. Now, an engine surge is if for some reason or another, and there are various things that can cause it, the airflow in the engine breaks down and the engine doesn't like it very much and it protests. And that's what this engine was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a very long complicated drill for an engine surge at Mach 2 
and it has two or three memory items and then you go into a massive long checklist which is basically troubleshooting to try and establish what it was yeah. that caused the surge mm -hmm. and if possible to fix it and carry on. The first item of the surge drill is to close all four throttles. That stops all the thumping and the banging. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. But it's also what was driving you along at Mach 2. And the deceleration is like going into a wall. Yeah. So the cabin crew and the trolleys and the passengers all come and join you on the flight deck <laughs> to come and give you a helping hand. And you then proceed with the drill. Now, the flight engineer was a very, very switched on guy, very good friend of mine called Bill Brown, who had spotted that the variable geometry intake in the number three engine had driven itself fully shut. Mm -hmm. The computer controlling, controlling it had gone bananas and had driven it into entirely the wrong position. And that was what was causing the surge. And he said, look, Skipper, instead of going through the whole checklist, can I just try this? And I said, Bill, if you think it was that, go for it. So he hard selected the alternate computer that controlled that intake. And incidentally, it should have automatically switched over to the other computer yeah. once it detected it, that it had done something that was completely disagreeing with what was going on with the other three intakes, it should have immediately switched to the alternate computer and it hadn't done so, but that's another, another story. Yeah. He hard selected it to that computer and we then very, very, very carefully opened that number three engine up and it was fine. The number two engine up, and it was fine. Opened up the outboards and everything was okay. And we resumed Mac 2 and carried on to to London so that was absolutely fine yeah I eventually got my voice down from a from a sort of high-pitched squeak and made a suitably reassuring announcement to the passengers <laughs> I can imagine. and then I thought oh, I'd better go back and see them all because the, normally we never went back into the passenger cabin we keep an open flight deck door and the passengers could come up and visit us ah, okay. anytime they wanted we never went back there because it interfered with the cabin service. Yeah. So I thought this rather sort of dramatic event justified going back and talking to them. And I went back and talked to every one of the passengers. And I remember getting to one British lady and she said, I don't know why you're worried about us, she said. Young man, she called me. And I said, what do you mean? Why? What are you, what are you talking about? And she said, you should be thinking of your cabin crew. And I said, why? And she said, they were absolutely terrified. And I said, oh dear, were well, they really? And I said, okay, well, I'll have a chat with them as well. Anyway, I've, I've explained to everybody that, you know, what it was. And that incidentally, in my experience as an airline captain, if you ever have problems, if you explain them to the passengers fully uh, what it was and what you're doing about it, and roughly how long you think it's going to be, yeah. if that's appropriate, it defuses problems enormously. Yeah. Anyway. I'd gone around and I'd had a chat with the cabin crew and they were all sort of comforted by my uh, reassurances and I went back up onto the flight deck and we landed at, at Heathrow and I thought well I'll go back to the front door and say goodbye to them all and I, <laughs> I was standing by the front door this is something I shall never forget as long as I live Concorde carried a lot of booze on it this lot had drunk the aeroplane completely <laughs> dry. They had drunk all the gin, the vodka, the scotch, the white wine, the red wine, the champagne, everything. the cognac, the port, anything, anything, all gone. Wow. And they came up, up the aeroplane like this, staggering about saying, thank you very much for a wonderful flight. <laughs> so that's one of my more memorable <laughs> Concord experiences. Oh, wow, that is, uh, pretty memorable, yes.